Welcome to Executive Insights. My guest today is Melissa Carvello, Global Cybersecurity Vice President with RBC. In this episode, we discuss what's changed in the identity and access management industry, the evolution of digital identity services, and Melissa's vision for promoting growth through identity strategy. We look at her interesting career journey and what inspired Melissa to take on a leadership role with RBC a few years ago. Finally, we explore the two topics Melissa feels very passionate about, strategies for creating a culture of inclusion and belonging, and how to attract more talent, especially women, into cybersecurity. Hi, Melissa. So great to see you and welcome to Executive Insights. Hi, Nishin. This is really exciting. I know it's been a long time coming, so um, thank you for having me here today. You're very welcome. So, Melissa, you've been in the space of cybersecurity since the very early days of your career, pretty much straight out of the university, and you're specialized in identity and access management. What's changed in IAM over the years, and how do you see digital identity services continue to evolve? Wow. Well, you know, I'm feeling really old because it's been about 20 years now. (laughs) And as much as things have changed, so many things have stayed the same. So maybe I'll start with what's stayed the same. And if I look at it, it's all the foundational components of identity. Things like authentication, logging in, access requests, directories where you store the data, privilege access, all the foundational components are necessary. As a rule of thumb, it still holds true that users get access to only what they need access to or the concept of least privilege. And when you hear new terms today like zero trust, that's what underpins it, the concept of least privilege. Now, what has changed? Well, the attacks have become so much more sophisticated. The everyday average citizen, if I think about my dad 20 years ago, he would ask me what I did. Now he knows that user ID and passwords are bad. (laughs) They're not acceptable. He asks me questions when he does banking, where we're storing the data, who has access to it. It's really become a differentiator with our customers. And if you combine the two of those things together, you think about all the new regulatory requirements, the reporting requirements of organizations, a lot has really changed. When I think about your question about evolution of identity and where the identity field is really going, I think back to the the fact that identity over the years has always stayed somewhat constant with identity being foundational to all our digital transformation. And I see it evolving into the real world situations. So many times people hear me talking about biometrics and the fact that um, it doesn't work for people of color, for example. Or if we take the recent pandemic vaccine passports and vaccine services, How many people rushed to put them into market, and yet it didn't work for people of different socioeconomic status? The the reality about the evolution is that um, I believe identity services are here to stay for any digital solution or transformation. And we really need to leverage our diversity to adapt with the changing times, but to offer practical and secure solutions. Yeah, so well said, and I couldn't agree with you more. And I remember 15 years ago, you and I both worked at some microsystems and we both were sort of involved in the identity management space, me sort of, but you definitely, and you were on the services side and I was on the marketing side. And you know, what you said really rings true about the core value proposition of identity management of cybersecurity still rings very much true today, but it's really the sophistication of the environment, the proliferation of the technology, social media and explosion of data and the attacks and um, the adversaries are getting smarter and more sophisticated all the time. So speaking of Sun Microsystems, you've had a very interesting career journey. And um, I know at certain point you made a deliberate decision to go from an employee to a contractor and that lasted for a period of 12 years. Then a few years ago, you got one over by RBC and decided to put your employee hat back on. What inspired these changes of directions? Wow, so the employee to contractor, well, that was the proverbial uh, glass ceiling. Uh, one of the things that I was raised to believe when I, when I graduated was you join an organization and you stay with that organization until the day you retire, just because that's what my parents did. Um, and that's what they raised me to believe. 
I loved where I worked. But every year I would sit down, I think I was 28 at the time, put my goals forward, worked with management, put really high targets, get to the end of the year, exceeded those targets, and still I didn't get to the next level. And it was a, a stressful process. But when I looked at my peer group and people at a higher level, I felt that I was being held accountable to a higher standard than most. And that's something that I hear today when I talk to a number of women on their career journey. So it really hasn't changed. I think for me, the toughest thing I had to say to myself was, I believe in me. <laughs> and that's so hard to do sometimes because you constantly have this self-doubt. When I finally put my hand up and said, looked in the mirror, I believe in me, then I had to work with my management team because I really didn't want to leave to say, this is what I want. This is where I want to get to. Otherwise, I'm going to leave. And it took me a year. So it wasn't something I decided and I just changed. Um, and I think part of my growth journey was realizing that there wasn't room for me in that role, in that organization, and to leave the organization. Uh, you know, I was extremely fortunate or blessed because I was in an economic situation at the time that I could just take a leap and become a contractor. And then I was even more blessed to be surrounded by individuals. I think I met you in the journey um, of becoming the contractor machine because I took away from each of the individuals along my journey. Now, from going to contractor employee, that was equally as difficult because for 12 years, I looked in the mirror every day and said, I believe in myself, I can do this. Um, and so it was really hard to trust in another organization to go back to the time when um, you needed to rely on other people. RBC made that really easy. I love their work culture. They are a people-driven organization. They believe in people and client first. Now, I can't say all 100,000 people in the organization feel that every single day, <laughs> but they gave me the opportunity to be the change I wanted to see. And so after 12 years of contracting, I proved that I could do it myself. But one of the things that RBC gave me the opportunity to do was the ability to make a difference, make an impact, and really to work with a team of diverse individuals so that I no longer went from being a single contributor to delivering as a team, which meant I could deliver a lot more. What you said about the frustrations with the glass ceiling is so profoundly true, and it truly resonated with me as well. And that's the whole reason why I decided to branch out and be a, an entrepreneur, because that way I can be my own boss and I can give myself promotions at any time I wanted. But speaking of RBC, you're driving identity strategies, promoting growth and improving operational efficiency. The operational efficiency piece is no brainer, but how do you promote growth through an identity strategy? So if we think of identity as the foundation for all our digital transformation, when you go from on-premise to cloud, from legacy to um, you know, more modern solutions, then application teams have to think about what that identity solution is gonna look like. And if application teams can abstract that and use reusable components, then they're able to focus on what they do best, which is knowing and understanding the application. I'll give you an example. Let's take the everyday banking app. Users need to log into that app. Application teams need to think about, are they gonna have user ID and password? Are they gonna put a stronger form of authentication? How users are gonna log out? But they have to also think about all the changing regulation, all the possible attacks, and they have to ensure that that whole process is built efficiently. Because the last thing somebody wants to do is enter user ID, password, hit submit, and then wait one or two minutes. Because you think, you know, like knock on the screen, is the application still working? And so if you look at that, and then you think about that application team having to put it on a mobile device, they have to think about it all over again. And then when you think about growth um, in, a, in a bank like ours, that same user who logs into the bank, banking application could have a credit card service. They could have a rewards program. They could be a trading using the trading applications, the wealth management applications, and each of those have different application teams. And so imagine that user experience if everybody did different things. And so by putting forward an identity strategy that's reusable, that's plug and play, you abstract it from the applications and you allow application teams to focus on what they do best. And it actually turns into be an accelerator for businesses. That's a, a really excellent example. So, and, and great business casing, by the way. And I think <laughs> that's an area that some of the uh, IT executive and cyber executives are struggling with is it's easier to justify that bottom line message, but it's so much harder to present that top line growth message. So excellent insight. 
you recently spoke at the Women in IT Summit in Canada at a cybersecurity panel, and you spoke about diversity and, and inclusion. And I know you're a very strong advocate for DEI and women in IT. How do you create a culture of inclusion and belonging within your organization? Can you share some tips and examples? Yeah, I'd like to think of myself as just learning from my journey and learning from my experience. And one of the things that I struggled on with my journey was feeling a sense of belonging and inclusion. And when I finally felt that way, I was able to bring my true self into the office and I, I was able to accomplish so much more. So for me, it's about acknowledging that I don't know it all, that I'm human and I make mistakes. I take time to actively listen um, and I put myself in uncomfortable situations and I do so because I don't wanna look around the room and see everybody thinks like me and looks like me because I won't grow if I do that. So some of the tips of things that I do within my own team and how I grow my team, uh, I meet with the 250 person team because I manage about 250 people, but I meet with them every week and I do a session, what we call ask me anything. And maybe Nasheen, that's for another day to tell you some of the stories that I've learned through the Ask Me Anything sessions. But um, it's having that open dialogue um, and being able to answer their questions. I also hold smaller sessions. So about 15 people every other week, um, more like coffee chats, even though it's virtually. And I try to figure out what they want to see more of, what they want to see us keep the same and what they want to see us change. And then I think most importantly, I follow up. Being in cybersecurity, people often ask me what keeps me up at night, and people are surprised at my answer, but it's if I upset somebody in my team, if it's I, I don't be, I'm not able to fulfill what they ask me to do. And I know I'm not perfect and I can't fulfill everybody's request. Um, the thing is, I have to explain the logic of why I didn't fulfill their request. So they don't sit like I did when I was 28 years old trying to achieve goals that I could never achieve. For me, belonging and inclusion is just that. It's ensuring everyone feels safe to have their voice heard, bring their true self into work, and then an ability to attain the goals they want to achieve. So I wanted to address a couple of points you just said here. First is the ability to listen. And, you know, I, I hear many people say, yeah, the ability to listen to our people. And that is so important. But the second piece, which is to follow up. And I haven't heard that from many people. And I'm so glad you brought that piece up because I think, you know, to listen to somebody and to really act on what you heard is completely different. And I can, you know, vouch for that because every time you and I had a conversation, we talked about certain to do items and you always beat me with an email outlining, here's what I'm going to do. So kudos to you for truly practicing what you're preaching. And, you know, I wanted to kind of close up this conversation on another popular topic, which is the shortage of talent in cyber, and especially women in cyber. How can organizations attract more women into this space? I really think it goes back to the previous question of belonging and inclusion. Uh, it's a bit of a vicious cycle, in, in my opinion. We say we want more women in cyber roles, and then we put job criteria forward that says you have to have this many years of education and this many years of experience. Well, let's just look at my life, for example. When I was in school and I went to an IT course, I was the only woman in an IT course <laughs> in many cases. Um, that was in elementary school, in high school, and in university. And then when I got a job and started working and consulting across North America, Europe, um, you know, Asia Pacific, I was still the only woman in many meetings um, and in many discussions I've had. So how do we expect um, women to apply for jobs with that much experience and that much education when we just don't see it in, in what we do? And I, so I think it's, we really need to change the criteria um, that we put out there for those roles. We then need to also give back. So regardless of whether we suffer from imposter syndrome, doing sessions like these and talking about our journey is really important. Going back into the schools and um, teaching um, children at a younger age, demystifying what it's like to work in this space is important. Um, and most importantly, we need to all accept that if we look at a good cyber team, they don't necessarily have that many years of experience and they have that many um, years of education. It's that they're able to take real world examples and um, stop vulnerabilities from happening in advance of them happening. If you look at my personal history, my goal was to be a high school teacher. I graduated from university as a high school teacher. I still pay my Ontario College of Teachers dues every year. 
yet I am a cybersecurity professional. Yeah. That is very insightful. I think, you know, the point you made about going back to the grassroots and demystifying the perception of the, the industry, the field is so important because oftentimes we send these wrong messages to young people and especially girls. And when they look at technology or cybersecurity field, they think about coding, but there's so many disciplines in the field of cybersecurity all the way from operations, to strategy, to marketing. So I think that's the message that we really need to make a conscious effort to refine from a, a very early stage. So Melissa, this has been such an insightful and inspiring conversation. I wish we could just keep on talking for hours, and I know we could. But thank you so much once again for your time today. And thank you for having me here today. You've been watching another episode of Executive Insights by the IT Media Group. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this video, please check out other content on our YouTube channel, including CIO Roundtable Conversations and Executive Interviews. And don't forget to subscribe.